is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London and for Francine while she's at London Tech Week. Here's what's on today's program. The unstoppable Nasdaq. Tech shares fuel global equity gains ahead of today's all-important U.S. inflation print. The final piece of the economic jigsaw before tomorrow's Fed decision. Stimulus required. China is said to be weighing a broad range of measures, including property support to spur growth after an unexpected cut by the PBOC to short-term interest rates. Plus, the U.K. labor market unexpectedly tightens with a surge in wages, putting more pressure on the Bank of England. Later this hour, an exclusive conversation with U.K. labor leader Keir Starmer at London Tech Week. Let's get a look at these markets this morning. U.S. equities seem unfazed by what bond markets are seeing this morning. Both U.S. futures and European equities are moving higher. U.S. futures really fueled by the tech trade. Apple at an all-time high. Tesla on its longest winning streak on record. Oracle, a big beat and a big gain overnight. Meanwhile, you're looking at China. The yuan is trading at a six-month low following an unexpected cut to the short-term rates. What does that mean for their MLF cut or what's expected to be a cut later. The big mover, though, are U.K. gilt yields and the pound. That is uh, rising versus the dollar. U.K. gilt yields now uh, on the front end of the curve, up 10 basis points. Uh, I'll show you that chart in just a moment. But let me take you to the European map, um, to the overall picture of what we're seeing right now. Again, for the most part, stocks are higher, save for the IBEX. Uh, the IBEX is underperforming this morning, down about four-tenths of 1%. But most of these markets are higher, a little bit less so for U.K. stocks, again, might be some of the currency effect there. But then again, back to what we're seeing in the U.K. It was an unexpected hot jobs report. It was a surge in wages and unemployment dropped. What results is this. You're looking right now at the front end of the curve. U.K. two-year yields, they have surpassed that trust mini budget era high when we had that LDI crisis. But just keep in mind that was led by the long end of the curve. So not necessarily that doom and gloom here, but nonetheless, it is a much higher gilt yield now. Joining us at the moment is Laura Cooper, BlackRock Senior Macro Investment Strategist. Um, Laura, uh, we'll get to the UK picture in, in just a moment, but quickly, I want to break some news on China. There may aggregate financing coming in at one and a half billion yuan. The estimate was for 1.9 billion yuan. Loans were also lower, 1.3 billion yuan. The estimate was for 1.5. So I really wanted to go in on UK with you, but I just want to take a moment and, and pause and talk China because we also had that cut, um, that unexpected cut in the short-term rates. Um, will this help global growth if we are starting to get some more support from policymakers in China? I think the read across from today's surprise move is really that they're sending a signal that they're there to support the economic recovery, notably as we have seen this slowdown in the reopening momentum in China, but it's not yet seen as this injection of stimulus. So I think it's too soon to tell whether we're going to see this impulse from Chinese growth spill over to the rest of the global economy, which we stu still do think is going to be quite challenged through mm. the end of the year. Right. And I mean, here again, we have aggregate financing data, a big miss, yet another piece of China data that has missed. Is the narrative of, okay, China reopens, we get this spur in growth, it, it, is that pretty much over or are we, are we still waiting for a period when it does pick back up? I don't think it's over necessarily. If we look at some of the key components of Chinese growth, the credit transmission channel has really been kind of not as what we would have expected in terms of that strong propulsion towards Chinese activity. So that could come later this year. And those policy levers at the margin could help to propel that further. But I think at this point, from a positioning perspective in portfolio, we do still like the broad EM space. China, yes, is a small component of that. Our conviction on the reopening has waned somewhat, mm. but we do still think there's attractive opportunities in the emerging market space, given the growth dynamics, the central bank divergence in policy that we are seeing between developed markets and emerging markets. Is there anywhere specific EM that you like, any nation specifically? I mean, I think at this point we are waiting to see the China strength, whether that kind of resumes in the second half of the year. That will be kind of key to that. But as well, if we think about commodity exporters, mm. yes, we've seen oil come under pressure, but there is still this structural imbalance between supply and demand. We do think that is going to really be that key tailwind for a lot of these emerging market countries, like LATAM in particular. Okay, now finally shifting back to the UK, those those pesky headlines ruining, ruining our flow here. So we do have front-end yields back at a 2000 
2008 high. You have pound surgeon Catherine Mann making comments yesterday about inflation not yet being able to rein in. Do you expect yields then to move even higher from where they are at this moment? I don't think that's the case. If anything, I think today's move is really a knee-jerk reaction, mm. as you mentioned at the beginning, around average earnings coming in much hotter than expected. And that really is quite problematic for the Bank of England. So the markets are reacting to the fact that we could actually see the BOE have to extend their tightening cycle. We're already seeing that June 22nd market event potentially having that 50 basis point increasingly priced in. That's certainly not our base case. But I think markets are suggesting that, look, in Inflation remains exceptionally elevated in the UK. That's going to be a problem, requires this tightening of policy. Our view is that we see a terminal rate closer to around that 5% mark, not mm. that kind of 5.6, yes. 5.7% markets are pricing. So we do think there is going to be some repricing ahead as we start to see some of that economic resiliency fade. And so that suggests there is some room to position in duration further out the gilt curve because of the market moves do appear overdone. Okay, and, and, well, and what would it mean to have a Bank of England that needs to keep hiking, that kind of goes the way of the Bank of Canada and RBA if the, if the Fed is going to pause this week. Well, I think it's already largely in the price. If we think about what markets are expecting from the Bank of England, it's exceptionally aggressive. Where if we compare that to what we are seeing in terms of swaps pricing in the U.S., it's probably more in line with our expectation that, yes, the Fed could have one, at most two more hikes in the pipeline, but is really the repricing will come from the Bank of England. Because I think there is this risk of stagflation that's most acute in the U.K. versus what we are seeing in the U.S., where data has been resilient. There are showing some signs of inconsistency in terms of some of the, the labor market gauges. But ultimately, we do think this is still a challenging economic backdrop for mm -hmm. the UK because policy rates where they are now are in quite restricted territory, given our estimate of neutral. That is going to have spillover effects to the economic activity. Yeah, I, I got to say, Laura, I can't believe it's basically every central bank has a decision except for the BOE. And for some reason, this is the most pertinent and market moving story right now. Um, but look, going back to the US, Yes. Um, a lot of folks have wanted to put st the steepener trade on for, for really to start this year, but it hasn't quite paid off. We continue to be surprised by inflation. Is now the time finally for that trade? I mean, certainly, I think that the steepener trade is the trade of the year. And given where we are in the cycle, that's what you would expect, that re-steepening in the curve to occur. I think last week we did have that bounce in initial jobless claims, really kind of spook the markets, anticipate this Fed pause. So timing that move could be a little bit tricky. Where we are seeing opportunities in the U.S. curve is really around the belly of the curve. Mm. So the front end, we think, is going to have more volatility as we really wait to see how the data unfolds for the Fed's policy path to get more clarity there. The long end, the fact that inflation, I mean, core PCE is about that 4.7% mark on average of the past several months, investors will likely demand higher term premium to park out in those long term tenors. Right. So it's really the belly, the three to seven year where we have seen yields back up to the highs that we have seen in March. So valuations are more appealing. And when we look at for previous Fed pauses, we do tend to see that segment of the curve really be the one that outperforms. Mm. So that's where we are seeing more of, of comfort in taking that duration exposure. Laura, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Thank you so much for joining this morning. Really appreciate it. That is Laura Cooper, BlackRock Senior Macro Investment Strategist. Coming up, Premira is hunting for investments with low double-digit yields after raising $4.5 billion for its latest and fifth fund. We're going to be speaking exclusively with David Hirschman, head of private credit at Premira, next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, the world of private credit has been rapidly expanding, eating away at the market share of banks and growing to one and a half trillion dollars. One of Europe's largest direct lenders, Premier Credit, has just closed its latest funding round, raising four and a half billion dollars for its fifth fund. Joining us now exclusively is David Hirschman, who heads up private credit at Premier. David, thank you so much for joining this morning. Thanks for having me, Danny. Um, look, it's, uh, we were talking in, in the commercial break, and I was basically saying to you, like, I'm tired of hearing that it's the golden age of private credit, but it kind of is, right? There is so much demand right now. Where is most of that demand coming from? Are you seeing different types of investors now interested in your products? 
Um, we do. So um, obviously we're very pleased with the, the result and, and the fundraising for our fifth uh, vintage. And we're seeing um, institutions from across the world, mainly pension funds, insurance companies, um, some of our existing investors from previous vintages, but also new, new investors. That shows a very strong appetite for the asset class. And, and also coming back to your point about is this the golden age of, of private debt? I mean, in many ways, we think it is. Um, because we're getting very attractive risk-adjusted returns, probably better than what we've seen in the last two decades. But we also have to be mindful that it's a volatile environment. We have to remain very disciplined. Um, and so I, I think you can't raise uh, four or five billion euro of capital without a very solid track record. Mm. And that's what investors want to see. What happens if you don't have that track record in this environment? Because a lot of people want to ride that same trend you're talking about. Are they able to? Well, I think we're going to see differentiated performance across key asset managers in private debt in Europe over the next few years. Um, there is going to be clearly a, a difference in um, the consistency of track record, the default rates, the loss rates. And I think that's going to separate the, the, the good from the less good uh, players in the market. Mm. Um, and ultimately, there may be consolidation, but some asset managers will maybe leave the market and not be able to raise mm. another fund. What would, what would consolidation look like? Is it possible to do mergers among private credit? I don't know if the structure is set up right, or do you just have firms that go bust? Well, um, so what we've seen in more so in the US, I think, than in Europe, but there has been consolidation. Mm. Um, now, in Europe, it's still relatively early stage. There's not been really a lot of consolidation in the market. But we are also in a very consolidated market already. If you take the top 10 players in Europe for private debt together, uh, which we're one of them, we account for about 80 to 90% of all the transactions in Europe. Um, but the key, I think, is really the quality of the performance and the quality of the uh, portfolio monitoring, having a, a very solid portfolio monitoring team involved early on in the investment decision process. And I think that's key to mm. um, minimize losses, minimize defaults over the life of a fund. And, and, and one of the reasons popularity has grown is this is the step back from banks, especially this environment this year. Um, do you expect banks to come back at any point and kind of re-grab some of the market share? Yeah, I think at some point um, they will. I mean, clearly private debt has gained a lot of market share in the last um, 12 to 24 months. Um, which is what we had seen in the US. In fact, we think Europe is probably five to 10 years behind, behind the US in that um, respect. Banks will come back. The syndicated loan market will, will come back. But sponsors have seen the advantages of working with private debt funds, even for large cap transactions. Um, so it's not unusual to see a club deal, a 1 billion euro debt uh, or more with five, six, seven lenders. What makes the, the private debt product attractive for those sponsors is the certainty of execution and the availability of a delayed draw piece, um, which is, makes it really compelling for sponsors. And I mm. think that even when the syndicated loan market reopens, um, private debt remains a very strong and competitive source of financing. Well, one of the other differences we've seen from public uh, credit markets and, and private ones is in the public market, there's a lot of data out there of defaults starting to pick up. Um, there's a stat from Goldman that uh, so far defaults this year exceed in the U.S. market specifically, already exceed 2021 and 2022 combined. But we, I, we really don't hear much of a peep out of private debt markets. Why is that? Um, well, maybe not yet, but um, it's true in a volatile market, you expect to see an increase in, in defaults. Um, we, what we see in our market is private in particular in the last few years has concentrated on um, non-cyclical industries um, with business with high margins, high cash flow generation and um, relatively low loan to value ratio which means there's a lot of equity in the capital structure at the, at the outset. Mm. Um, that in itself, high cash generation and comfortable uh, debt service coverage ratio uh, mitigates the risk of a default. Now, obviously, if we enter into a, a recession that was clearly the fear, deep global recession a year ago, um, we might see an increase in, in defaults. Mm. But so far, I mean, a lot of this is private information, so um, I only have really visibility on our portfolio. Right. Um, 
but we're not really seeing uh, an increase in, in default rates. Okay. David, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for Thanks joining. Thanks very much for Congratulations having Congratulations again on the new fundraise. That is David Hirschman, uh, head of private credit at Premier Credit. All right, coming up on the show, what's the way forward for European banks? We're going to get the view of Goldman Sachs International CEO Richard Nade in our exclusive interview next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Goldman Sachs International CEO Richard Nade says the bank is seeing some green shoots that signal a pickup in IPOs. Speaking exclusively to Francine Lacqua, Nade also discussed potential job cuts, market volatility, and the European banking sector. Well, to start with, um, you know, they're in a much stronger place than they've been for, well, probably 15 years. And so if you look at you know, strength of balance sheet, capital ratio is probably three times what they were going back to 2007. Liquidity, much, much stronger. And really the underlying strength of the balance sheet is strong. So whatever lies in front of us, you know, I think we are in a good starting position. Are you confident that what will be in the pipeline, so it should be M&A and IPOs, will get better rather than get worse from here? I think we're starting to see some green shoots you know, in terms of IPOs. We've got a number of IPOs in the market right now. They've, they've still got a price. You know, some of the IPOs done in the earlier part of the year got done but didn't trade so well afterwards. And, I, and that's obviously a key, key measure. So one is the pricing and then the aftermarket performance. So we'll have to watch that. There's been a lot of block activity. There's been a lot of secondary sell downs you know, throughout this year and the market has absorbed those and absorbed them well. You know, on the M&A side, corporates are certainly looking. You know, we saw another big healthcare transaction announced, announced this morning. Um, the sponsor network is looking. Some things are getting done. I, I think the, the bid offer is still, um, is still too wide. So from a pricing point of view, we haven't quite, quite gotten there yet. But you can see people are looking to do things. So, so there are signs of activity, yes. Do, do you worry that actually you're, you're losing business, that Wall Street titans in general losing business to either smaller boutiques or brokers or even domestic banks? No, I think we have, we have you know, a lot of confidence in the strength of our M&A franchise. And, and it's really built on, well, first, a hugely experienced team across geographies, across industrial sectors. You know, people who've been in the business for a very, very long period of time. And, and it is an experience-based business. And being able to connect the dots on a global basis, and I think that's become, if anything, more and more important. So there's that component to it. And then the financing component, and being able to bring the full package. And you know, it's one thing knowing what you want to do. It's another thing being able to finance what you want to do. And, and, and we can help on, on all fronts. And, no, so I, I think we feel, we, we, we feel good about our franchise, but it comes down to client relationships being part of that intimate dialogue, and certainly from where I sit, you know, I see that as strong as ever. Are you done with job cuts? Well, we right now, as you know, we dis disclosed last week, you're going through a, period, a process for a small number of people, 250, you know, thereabouts. We obviously had a more significant exercise at the beginning of the year. And that's all in response to our perception that markets were going to slow down. They certainly have slowed down. And some ongoing weakness across markets. And so we want to make sure that the, the firm is, is right-sized. The reason that this exercise is, is very targeted and small is that we're really targeting those parts of the business which are slowing down. Not all parts of the business are slowing down. Goldman Sachs International CEO there, Richard Nade, speaking exclusively to us. Now let's get to the Bloomberg First Word News. With that is Sarah Halls. Sarah. Thanks, Danny. China's central bank has cut a short-term policy interest rate, easing its monetary stance to help aid economic recovery. The PBOC lowered the seven-day reverse repurchase rate by 10 basis points to 1.9%. The easing comes ahead of the PBOC's monthly operation on Thursday of its medium-term lending facility. Seven of 16 economists surveyed by Bloomberg also expect a reduction in the one-year MLF rate. JP Morgan has agreed to pay $290 million to settle a lawsuit 
alleging it knowingly benefited from sex trafficking by former client Jeffrey Epstein. The bank says the agreement in principle would settle a class action filed last year by an unnamed Epstein victim. A source says the bank will not admit liability. In a statement, JP Morgan says its association with Epstein was a mistake it now regrets. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the Trump administration was slow to counter Chinese spying overseas after discovering that Beijing had been operating a spy facility in Cuba since 2019. He says the past administration was aware Beijing was expanding its intelligence efforts and failed to slow it down. The White House has acknowledged the presence of Chinese facilities in Cuba that could be capable of spying on southeastern parts of the U.S. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Sarah Halls, and this is Bloomberg. Danny. Sarah, thank you very much. Coming up on the program, Ukraine's Europe allies meet in Paris as Kyiv pushes ahead with its counteroffensive against Russia. We'll have the details of that meeting and what's to come for NATO next. This is Bloomberg. Unstoppable Nasdaq tech shares feel global equity gains ahead of today's all-important U.S. inflation print, the final piece of the economic jigsaw before tomorrow's Fed decision. Stimulus required. China is said to be weighing a broad range of measures that include property support to spur growth after an unexpected cut by the PBOC to short-term interest rates. Plus, the U.K. two-year yield rises to its highest since 2008 as the labor market unexpectedly tightens. Shortly, an exclusive conversation with U.K. labor leader Keir Starmer at London Tech Week. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, Emmanuel Macron says he hopes Ukraine's military counteroffensive against Russia will be as successful as possible and lead to talks. The French president met, met with the leaders of Germany and Poland in Paris yesterday to discuss coordinating military assistance to Kyiv. For more on this, let's go out to Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Um, so, Maria, we had Macron, Duda and Schultz all reiterating their support for Ukraine. But what about the long term plan for long term security? Yes, Danny, good morning. And this is the Weidmer Triangle. These are countries that are strategically important uh, for Ukraine politically, of course, but also geographically, especially uh, when you look at a country like Poland. And yes, they repeated yesterday, we will stand with Ukraine for as long uh, as it takes. I was personally particularly struck with the words coming from the German chancellor who said Vladimir Putin made, quote, a fatal mistake when he invaded uh, Ukraine. And you alluded to this, and this is particularly important, the words of Emmanuel Macron, too, uh, who said he had a conversation with the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and appeared to also confirm that this counteroffensive, remember there had been a lot of secrecy uh, around it, is now indeed underway. The French president also signaled that it could go on for weeks, maybe even months. But again, going back to this idea that if Ukraine wins the upper hand uh, on that counteroffensive, it will be better placed to therefore then talk about peace. But beyond that, uh, Danny, there is a fundamental question here, and this is why this meeting yesterday is so relevant and is so important, and is this idea of what kind of security framework can the West provide to Ukraine? And when you speak to diplomats behind the scenes, they tell you by now it is clear there is a pattern of aggression from Russia to Ukraine. They have not been able to contain it, and they have not been able to break this pattern. So obviously the country needs a new framework. The issue, and this is really the issue, when you talk about security uh, framework for Ukraine, it can mean anything. Some talk about the Israeli uh, model. Other people talk about bilateral security assurances for Ukraine. And then, of course, there's just always that perennial debate about should Ukraine enter NATO. But the significance of the meeting yesterday is that it finally triggers and kicks off this debate among European countries. Obviously, the United States will be a key player. And that takes us to the Vilnius summit in Lithuania that will happen next month that is seen as a crucial moment again for NATO, but also this idea of what is Ukraine's relationship when it comes to the biggest military alliance. Well, elsewhere at that summit, Maria, at NATO summit next month, what you're talking about, are, are we likely to see Turkey finally give the green light to Sweden's entry? 
Look, and, and this is becoming now, at this point, incredibly problematic for the Swedish uh, government. They were waiting for the Turkish election. Now, we know Erdogan uh, won that election. To some extent, they are already familiar with him and already negotiated uh, this entry a year ago. But the Turks still say Sweden has to do more when it comes to some of the issues on issues like terror, that they believe uh, the Swedish government could be doing more. The problem, of course, is that the Swedes say they have done enough already, and it's now Turkey that needs to move. There is a meeting planned for this week, but sources tell Bloomberg that not a lot will happen. Do not expect a breakthrough in that situation, but the clock is ticking. The Secretary General of NATO also repeating Sweden has to join at this point. It's the only way to guarantee the Nordic security, but also you've created this situation where Finland has joined, but it's closest ally and neighbor, Sweden, has not. So that is obviously becoming not just a military problem in terms of NATO, but also politically an issue for Sweden. Okay, Maria, thank you very much. That is Maria Tadeo, our Europe correspondent in Brussels. Now, quick check on your market. U.S. futures are moving higher. They are led by tech. I was just quickly looking up the Oracle pre-market trade. They had earnings yesterday. Post-market, they surged. Pre-market up another four and a half percent. If that sticks, it will be an all-time high. It really is this euphoria in tech. No fear for today's CPI. Apple also hit an all-time high yesterday. Tesla, its 12th day of gains. That is a record streak for a uh, rec record streak rather for the EV maker. Also looking at their pre-market, they're up yet again 1.3 percent. Elsewhere, the macro stories revolve around China. Reports of more support there and the UK, an unexpectedly tighter labor market, a surge in wages and unemployment dropping. That has caused what you're seeing there, the two-year yield up another 13 basis points. That is leading the gains, the belly, the 10-year yield, that's moving about five. Five-year yield, that's moving about 11 basis points. And what we have is a UK two-year yield, which has surpassed the trust era high. It is now trading at a 2008 high. Of course, the difference this time is the run-up. Yes, it has been steep, but not as steep as the trust era. And that was really led by the long end of the curve because of what we saw in the LDI crisis, having to sell off some of those assets. So it's not the same type of market panic, but this is significant nonetheless. It is pricing in about 5.6% or higher for the terminal rate for the December rate. Uh, we're just talking to Laura Cooper over at BlackRock, who is saying that they don't expect that. They expect something like 5%. Um, so there is indeed some repricing that needs to be done on this market. Okay, coming up, we're, we're going to continue this conversation because there is a lot to discuss with the UK labor market unexpectedly tightening. We have that response in guilt markets. We'll dig into all the numbers with Lizzie Burden next. This is Bloomberg. Talk tech. Google, Google DeepMind is one of the UK's leading artificial intelligence research labs. Its CEO and co-founder says that AI will massively accelerate scientific and medical breakthroughs in the next few years, with the potential to treat illnesses like cancer or dementia. However, Demis Hassabis warns that there are potential downsides. He spoke exclusively to Tom McKenzie at London Tech Week. I think there are three different types of, uh, uh, broadly speaking, buckets of risk. Uh, I think number one is uh, bad actors using these dual purpose technologies in ways that are bad for society. I think that's true of any new transformative technology down the years. So I think AI is no different other than the fact that it's maybe the most general type of technology. So, um, so that becomes a question of access to these technologies and that's what needs to be thought about there. I think the second one is near term use cases where uh, things like deep fakes or disinformation or uh, uh, bias in our systems uh, that can affect near term products and applications that we see today. Uh, and I think that has to be mitigated by uh, some new technologies, things like watermarking and, and so you can detect deep fakes, but also uh, existing regulation being beefed up uh, in areas like health or transport to deal with the coming new wave of AI, just like we did with the Internet and mobile. And then finally, there are these longer term technical uh, AI risks 
uh, that I think more research is required to understand them better, understand these systems, where they're going, to, uh, f to allow us to sort of figure out what the bounds are of what these systems can do, how mm. we can control them, what, how do we align them to human preferences. Uh, and then once we understand those better, uh, uh, we can sort of, government and others, uh, international society can um, uh, sort of put the guardrails around it. Um, so I think uh, it's important when you're in very uh, regions of, you know, accelerating technology, high uncertainty, um, doesn't mean things are going to go wrong, but it means that we're, it's uncertain about what the underlying technology is going to look like in five, ten years, then I think we should proceed um, with what's called the precautionary principle. So proceed with exceptional care and thought and use things like the scientific method. You're, you're very used to putting probabilities on things. So I just want to push you on the most extreme area and the most yeah. extreme risk. And it, I feel almost, high, it feels hyperbolic to yes. talk about hyperbole, to talk about, to talk about potential extinction as a result right. of AI. But in your time, whether it's developing games or as a chess grandmaster, mm -hmm. you know about how to put probabilities sure. on things. What would you put the probability at of AI-linked yep. Extinction. Well, look, I think it's, 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 um, I don't think you can, no one can put a probability on these things. Mm. I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, you know, the probability many of my colleagues think is very small. Um, but even if it's very small, uh, uh, one should pay attention to those things and ahead of time, not wait for those things to happen. And if you look at things even like, you know, much less powerful things like social media uh, uh, of the last decade, fantastic benefits to society, many things in individuals and our, in our social lives and so on, but also it has unintended consequences as we're now seeing. Uh, and so uh, I would like us with AI to get ahead of those things and to be pre-prepared and to put down the guardrail uh, society put down the guardrails ahead of time, not after the fact. Uh, and I think it's too important a technology not to get that right. So I think all that letter was saying is we should pay attention. And uh, I, you know, I think the Prime Minister and other governments are. And uh, I think things like the Global Summit that the Prime Minister announced in, in the UK, bringing together experts from around the world, uh, from academia, from civil society, from government and from industry, uh, to come and talk about these, uh, uh, these risks and these opportunities, and then what can be done to mitigate them. Mm. Uh, uh, for example, come up with the right evaluation tests and benchmarks to evaluate what these systems can do and the capabilities they have, um, uh, I think is the, the right next step. And so, for, for those who would say, look, even if there's just a one or two percent chance of a catastrophe, then you know, just stop, just stop where you're at. What would you say to, to those people? Well, as I said, we, we have no, you know, at the moment that there's a huge amount of uncertainty over uh, these future technologies. Mm -hmm. Very hard to predict what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 years' time. If you think back to 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we started DeepMind, no one thought AI was possible. Uh, no one was working on AI. In, in, when I remember when I was doing my postdoc in academia, the professors would eye roll at you, your, even the mention of AI as being something that's science fiction and not a serious subject. And look how far we've come in the last 10, 15 years. So I think it's hard to predict uh, 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 things going forward. But the reason to work on AI is what we discussed at the beginning, which is the potential it has to help society with all of these challenges that we have, from disease to climate to energy. Uh, all of these things, I think, can be impacted and helped by a technology, uh, an incredible tool like AI, helping the world's experts solve these problems. And what would you advise governments not just the UK government, governments around the world, to focus on, to prioritise now in terms of policies they can enact now to put some guardrails in place around this technology? I think the number one thing that needs to be done right now is to put more investment into uh, uh, AI safety research and understanding uh, uh, what these systems can do, analysing them, interpreting them, and then coming up with things like evaluation benchmarks so that we can uh, understand what capabilities we want uh, and, and what guardrails that we therefore should have to make sure um, society gets, reaps all the benefits of these uh, systems and the incredible potential they have and we mitigate the risks. Last question on jobs. You have children. Are yes. they, would you advise, what jobs would you advise your children to steer away from because you think that in 10, 15, 20 years they're just not going to exist? Again, I think the whole jobs question is, uh, is a very complicated one to predict. As with, uh, There's no doubt that AI is going to bring uh, changes and disruption. But I actually think if you look at the history of uh, these things like Internet and mobile over the last 10, 20 years, um, they also cause huge, cha huge mm. changes. But actually, um, whole new categories of jobs were invented, actually better quality jobs, higher paid jobs. Uh, and I think that's what's going to happen again with AI. I think it's going to change the job market. But I think uh, in, in, in the, in, uh, in the fruition, you know, fullness of time, I think it's going to create many more uh, higher quality and better paid uh, opportunities than we've had in the past.
Demis Hassabis there, the CEO and co-founder of Google DeepMind, a fascinating conversation and maybe a scary one with Tom McKenzie at London Tech Week. Now, also at London Tech Week, Bloomberg spoke to Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, about the opportunities in AI for the country. It's really important that we, uh, you know, we, 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 we try and understand the importance of not just AI, but other innovation coming in the tech uh, sector, not be scared of innovation. Innovation is good. Uh, what innovators want is some certainty. They want to know what the rules of the game are. Uh, they often want, you know, regulation, smaller and sometimes bigger as well. I tell you, it's not just Sadiq Khan, it is not just Google DeepMind. Everyone is excited, especially in this market, about AI. If you mention it in your earnings call, you probably have a good chance of seeing your shares push higher. We saw with Oracle yesterday a record price now on Oracle. If it's able to hold on to these pre-market gains, four and a third percent is where we move. Their cloud demand, it was strong, specifically citing what AI has done to their cloud demand. So now we're looking at Larry Ellison, who's for the first time richer than Bill Gates. Congrats, Larry. Now, elsewhere in tech, Bloomberg is compiling a list of the UK's most promising startups. If you know about a company that's doing something really innovative and unique and deserves some attention, let us know, won't you? That story is to come. But first, coming up here on the program, an exclusive conversation with UK labor leader Keir Starmer at London Tech Week. This is Bloomberg. Some breaking news to bring you on Crispin Odie's former fund, Odie Asset Management. According to a letter to clients seen by Bloomberg, they will be gatekeeping one of their funds, the Brooks Develop Market Fund, so no redemptions to come from there. We'll keep an eye on that. All right, let's pivot now and talk about London Tech Week. Let's take you over there because Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua is in a conversation with UK opposition leader Keir Starmer. Acknowledge it. Um, as I say, send our thoughts to those that are affected and thank those that are responding to it on behalf of all of us. Yeah, and, and Sir before we get on to tech, actually, and AI, it's been quite a weekend for UK politics. It has been quite a weekend um, for everybody following. Um, so on Friday night, I was doing a speech for Margaret Beckett, who's one of our longest-standing MPs. She's been an MP for 49 years. And I was in Derby... Um, with about 550 people thanking her for her service. And as I sat down, I got a note put in front of me that said, Boris Johnson has resigned with immediate effect. <laughs> um, and then on Sunday, I went for lunch. It was my wife's birthday. Went for lunch with a number of friends. And just as we were sitting down, I saw my phone ping up that Nicola Sturgeon had been arrested. Um, so that's quite a lot to pack in to one weekend. And obviously, it comes on the back of a very turbulent... 12 months or so. This time last year, Boris Johnson was Prime Minister. We've burnt through three Prime Ministers. We've had four Chancellors and four budgets in the last 12 months. Um, and, you know, politically, um, that makes for a lot of material. Um, it is certainly evidence of chaos. And a party... Political parties usually fight like this when they're out of office. It's very unusual to have it when they're in office. And now we've got three by-elections caused by just political fallout. Um, often you have by-elections because someone sadly dies or is very ill or there's some finding against them. To have three by-elections which are essentially political tantrums is really unprecedented. Um, and, you know, politically, obviously, from our point of view, um, you know, we look at it and see that chaos, but there is a price to be paid. And um, everywhere you go across the country... Most people are really worried about the cost of living. They're worried about how they're going to pay their bills. And for them to see a government squabbling with itself instead of focusing on what they need addressed, I think is you know, a very serious situation for this government to have got itself into. And there's a deeper price because there's a reputational hit to the UK. And I think there's an economic hit as well because many investors, and this is very relevant to what we're discussing this morning, many investors say to me, we're not investing in the UK right now because we don't see the conditions of certainty and stability that we need in order to invest. And that will affect people in this room, it'll affect startups, businesses, um, not only in tech, but across many, many sectors. So there's a political price 
of this chaos as well. But with the implosion of the SNP, do you see what kind of opportunity do you see for Labour in Scotland? Well, the implosion of the SNP has been very profound. Um, and uh, I think it's done two things. It's now allowed a proper examination of the SNP record in government. Until this point, the SNP was um, quite able to ensure that the only discussion in Scotland was about independence, about the referendum, constitutional issues, and not about the things that actually, in many respects, matter um, so much more to people. So now that torch, if you like, that light is shone on their record, and it's not a very good record. From our point of view, it obviously gives us an opportunity to make an argument about Scotland, about the future of Scotland, um, that, you know, means we are more likely to be heard as we go forward. We've got a strong case to put in Scotland, a very positive case to put in Scotland. Um, it doesn't necessarily flow that because the SNP implodes, SNP voters necessarily move to a different political party. We've got to earn every vote, we've got to make our case, but we've now got the chance to make that case. So we're at London Tech Week. Yeah. When you look at AI, is it a risk or a benefit? It, it, I mean, a, a bit of both. There are huge potential, um, and everybody in this room knows that, and um, you know, incredible opportunities. Um, I did a speech on the future of the NHS a few weeks ago, and my main thesis was the NHS is face down on the floor. Um, it needs to be back up on its feet. But more than that, it needs to be fit for the future, which is a different question. Part of making it fit for the future is using technology uh, to a much greater extent. There's an important report come out this morning on that. And one of the examples I used in my speech, which is about AI, was if a radiologist works with AI when doing scans for cancer, particularly liver scans, they're 60% more likely to get them at an earlier stage, which makes a massive difference, obviously, to the individual patient and a huge difference to the NHS as well. So huge, huge um, potential. But, of course, risks. Risks of misinformation, risks that it's used in ways which we wouldn't consider to be good. Risks more broadly that AI is accelerating so very fast that um, some of the jobs that are being done now by people will almost certainly be being done by AI, already are to some extent, but um, I'm really struck by the speed of acceleration of development in AI. And so we need to put ourselves in a position to take advantage of the great benefits, but guard against the risks. Do you use ChatGPT? And if so, what do you ask it? But so, uh, <laughs> I have a masterclass on ChatGPT um, almost every day because I've got a 14-year-old son. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump in here with an excellent question, but this is a good tease. Go watch the rest of this conversation on live. Go. I want to know what Keir Starmer asked ChatGPT. That's, of course, the UK Labour Party leader there with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua at London Tech Week. Previously, she asked him about the upheaval for SNP, him saying that it means Labour will be heard in Scotland, but they still need to earn every vote. Again, go watch that live. Go on your terminal. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. The latest U.S. inflation numbers come out today. They may give support to Fed officials looking to put their interest rate hike campaign on hold. More signs that China is growing worried about a slowing economy. Beijing is now considering a broad package of stimulus measures and the central bank surprisingly cuts a short-term interest rate. And Donald Trump's day in court. Thousands of supporters are likely to show up in Miami when the former president faces criminal charges of mishandling classified documents. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And markets here in Europe certainly moving on the China story. Certainly some optimism around tech still hanging around the global equity space. But really, we'll be focused on the CPI print come this afternoon. Europe time, Chrissy. Yeah, the inflationary story is fascinating, of course, stateside in Europe as well. But it's interesting how much of the inflation story is really coming 
coming from the Asia Pacific region at a time when they're really trying to spur a little bit of that growth. We're going to dive into that, but it is a major market theme because it has ripple effects around the world. Futures higher by about three tenths of one percent on that exact sentiment that you were just mentioning, Anna. What's important to me, though, is a read through into the bond market. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But the two year yield here, 456, as of course we see yields drop by just one basis point. A lot of that caution seems to be coming off of just what we're going to see from the CPI report today and, of course, the Federal Reserve tomorrow. But let's go back to the China story, Anna, because, again, that is going to have a massive effect on what happens here stateside. Remember, after the global financial crisis, part of the recovery was massive infrastructure uh, stimulus from China in 2009 and, of course, uh, 2010 as well. So as you start to see the 10-year yield move, what's important to keep in mind here is that it is a six basis point move. That is a more than four standard deviation move for the Chinese uh, debt market. Enormous when you look at the, the read through and of course copper as well taking in on that uh, risk kind of climb higher by 1.6 percent as we look at that commodity Anna. Let's have a look at the European markets then and the read across from that China story, the cut in the seven-day repo rate and the talk of broad support for parts of the Chinese economy, including perhaps property. Uh, this is what we see then across European equity markets. Some positivity coming through. This after strength in tech yesterday uh, also being echoed here in Europe. So uh, we are up by a fraction of a percent on the London market, the same over in Germany and in France. So modest gains coming through across European equity markets. I should mention what we're seeing on the investor sentiment side. We've just had a survey. The survey results from Germany, their June ZEW Investor Expectations Index, that's risen to minus 8.5. The estimate was that this would have a, a, du a double-digit handle, 13 or so. So certainly this number coming in uh, better than had been expected in terms of uh, investor sentiment. So that's what we see across European equity markets right now. Uh, the euro fairly unmoved by that latest ZEW survey. It was benefiting, uh, it, was, it was moving higher as, uh, as we'd seen the dollar in retreat today before we got this data, but that minus 8.5 compared to the expected minus 13.5, that was the number, uh, that hasn't moved the euro too much, but maybe consolidating a little positivity there. Uh, let's get back to the top of the board. This is where you see the read across from China, up by 2.3% on basic resource stocks. That plays well for London, of course, benefiting that particular sector breakdown in the markets. The UK two-year yield is really fascinating to say uh, today. We're up by 12 basis points at the two-year horizon. The labour market looking really tight. We'll get some further details on that, both in terms of the unemployment rate, which unexpectedly uh, showed more tightening on the uh, on the labour market side, so a tighter labour market than had been expected. Uh, we also got wage data that came in higher than expected, so all of that adding up to more rate hikes from the Bank of England and the market adjusts its expectations accordingly. The same is said for the pound, so the pound jumps on the back of that data. It was positive before that data, uh, and you see by the, compared to the euro, we're not seeing such an outsized move on the pound, but they have. we have seen the markets repricing expectations around the terminal rate for the UK. Chrissy? Certainly a lot of green on the screen, and a lot of it coming off of the story you're seeing in the Asia-Pacific region, which is where we go to next. China mulling a fresh package of stimulus measures to boost its economy, according to a Bloomberg report. This comes as the PBOC surprised markets with a rate cut earlier today. Bloomberg Economics reporter Jamie Rush joins us now for more. Jamie, walk us through the potential stimulus and the potential read-through around the world. Well, you know, China's economy is, is slowing, its growth rate is slowing. We've seen that we've got weak PMI data illustrating the scale of that slowdown. Um, and so the government is going to need to do something. And the question is, is what? So we've seen immediately already a 10 basis point cut in the repo rate. Um, that's likely to be followed by a 10 basis point cut in the marginal lending rate later on this week. Um, and so monetary policy is now responding. And we think there's probably more to be done. I mean, if you think about China's economy, there's a massive inv inv infrastructure overhang, certainly in the residential sector. That's not necessarily the right lever to be pulling right now. Um, we think there is much more for the central bank to be doing. Uh, the today's measures probably only add about 0.1 to the growth rate, at least that's what our economic models tell us. Uh, so there is more to be more to be done. We think an, maybe another 20 basis point cut is, is coming over the rest of the year. OK, so, so this is today's focus has been on that uh, seven day repo rate, but there is building expectation. I know you have expectation that we get a cut to the medium term lending facility as well. So we'll look for that uh, later on in the week. Let's pivot to the UK economy because we had jobs data out a few hours ago then, Jamie, and we'd expected that we'd see a little bit of loosening of the labour market story in the UK. Well, we didn't get that. We got more tightening, didn't we? Yeah, so, so the last report showed that the employment had dropped like, massively. Um, that's been revised away completely. So any evidence that the economy was, was cooling has now just disappeared. Uh, and we've also seen very, very strong numbers on the prices side, on the wages side. Uh, and 7% you know, pay growth, 
you don't need to be a genius to realise that's not going to be compatible with the 2% inflation rate. So there's a lot more for the Bank of England to be done. We're seeing markets repricing. We've changed our forecast. We think rates will go a bit higher. Um, but we'll see what the gravitational pull of the Fed does over the summer as that hiking cycle potentially comes to an end. OK, interesting one to watch, the domestic dynamic versus that international dynamic across the Atlantic. Jamie, thank you very much. Jamie Rush joining us there from Bloomberg Economics. Now, SoftBank-backed chip designer Arm is said to be in talks with potential investors, including Intel, to anchor what will be one of the largest IPOs of the year. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us now with details. Alex, how big could this IPO be then when we get to it? So the reporting suggests that they're looking for something in the order of $10 billion. They're looking to raise still a question mark. Bankers have pitched anything between 30 billion, which is actually about the price that uh, SoftBank paid for it a good few years ago, and 70 billion. Uh, given the IPO market, well, we'll have to see the way things are. It's not a terribly uh, bullish place to be right now. The fascinating thing OK, looks like we're having a bit of problem with uh, Alex's uh, line, which is a shame because uh, he's here in the studio somewhere, uh, not that far <laughs> away, but we seem to be having a little problem with the technology there. A really fascinating story, though, the involvement of Intel in that ARM IPO then, Chrissy, because uh, the, what, what is in this for Intel is really fascinating. If they want to turn themselves into more of a foundry, making chips on demand because, you know, clients to, to other people's designs, effectively, then they're going to need to get closer relationships with chip designers and that if you want that then you need to uh, have a have a relationship with arm so that's what it seems to be what this is all about of course and for a global audience it's important to remember that arm is the kind of unique uh, kind of uh, designer when it comes to graphic chips and essentially the design on new innovation when it comes to things like really sizing up uh, the production there also the fact that Intel is actually using this IPO as potentially part of its turnaround plan Anna is enormous because they are just now recovering from kind of the major restructuring that Pat Gelsinger had to lead over at that company and it's not the only company by the way uh, that's moving and that's having these big grand plans because Oracle is in the same boat Oracle we like to look at as kind of this old tech name Anna uh, their shares jumping to a record high because they use the magic word artificial intelligence but also because mm -hmm. the cloud unit there uh, drove that sales beat higher yeah. by 4.3% Anna and get this Larry Ellison now one of the, I think I want to say, one of the richest men in the world, uh, surpassing yes. some of the folks on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Absolutely. All you have to do is mention of AI and you go from uh, lower down the, the rankings up into number four. He's pushed B uh, Bill Gates out of the number four position to take that with Oracle shares up by 42 percent year to date. Uh, we need to talk about U.S. politics, Chrissy. We absolutely do, because we go from uh, the tech story to the political one in Miami. Police say as many as 50,000 people could turn up when former President Trump appears in federal court today. He's expected to plead not guilty to charges involving the mishandling of classified documents. Trump loyalists have promised a show of force. Bloomer's Kaylee Lines is on the scene in Miami, waking up early for us this morning. Kaylee, what does President Trump's schedule look like today? Well, he already has been here in Miami since yesterday when he flew down from New Jersey, Creedy, and it's really just a waiting game until 3 p.m. Eastern time. That is when he's expected to show up at this federal courthouse here in Miami. He will be arrested by authorities in process, potentially have his fingerprint and mugshot taken, and then he will go up to the 13th floor, appear before a judge, and as you said, we expect him to plead not guilty. Of course, since this indictment came down, the former president has claimed his innocence. He has called this a witch hunt, election interference uh, at the highest level. And that is probably a message that he will take out of the courtroom when he gets back on the plane, heads back to Bedminster, New Jersey, to appear tonight at his golf club there, where at 8.15 p.m. Eastern time, he will be speaking and meeting with donors. His campaign believes he could raise $2 million at this event tonight. And that's really what we're waiting to see is if uh, this particular indictment and court appearance proves to have the galvanizing effect among his supporters and donors, as we saw with the prior indictment uh, that happened in Manhattan earlier this spring. Of course, that was the first time the former president faced criminal charges. But this case here uh, that is uh, being dealt with in Miami today, this arraignment is the first time he's faced federal charges, 37 counts of mm. seven different crimes. Kaylee, great to see you. What kind of protests are we now expecting then? 
Well, as you said, we could see up to 50,000 people uh, in Miami today. That is what po uh, the police are expecting. And as a result, really strict security uh, is expected throughout the city today. And of course, we have to keep in mind that there has been a lot of rhetoric leading up to today's events. President Trump himself was speaking on radio over the weekend with Roger Stone, one of his former uh, advisors, saying that people need to show up and come and protest peacefully. But it's really a question of whether these protests will be peaceful because there has been as well a decent amount of violent rhetoric. For example, Carrie Lake, a former, uh, a relatively prominent Arizona Republican, was out over the weekend saying that if anyone wants to get to President Trump, they need to get through her and 75 million Americans like her, all of which she alluded to, or many of which are members of the NRA. So definitely a lot of security will be here today, bracing for any uh, potential disruptions uh, or violence surrounding the president's appearance. And Kaylee, of course, we know when he went through his iteration right here in Manhattan, a lot of the concern was around what that would mean for 2024. And yet it didn't really mean a whole lot at the time. Has any of that changed in terms of support for him as a candidate? No, this appears to be a pattern. We actually saw President Trump's polling go up in the light of his first indictment. And after the second one, it appears that he really still has not lost the support of his base. A CBS YouGov poll came out over the weekend that showed 76% of likely Republican primary voters uh, thought that their concern was that this is politically motivated, not that uh, national security was at risk. 61% of them said that this doesn't change their opinion of Trump at all. And actually 14% said that it uh, made their opinion of him better. 80% of them uh, said that he should still be able to be president even if convicted. So it doesn't appear at this point that it is uh, detracting at all from President Trump's front runner status in this race. And of course, we have to keep in mind while the legal proceedings really begin today with this arraignment, this could drag out for a long period of time, including up to or even beyond that election in November 2024. Kaylee, thanks very much. Kaylee Lyons joining us there from Miami with a briefing on the politics and uh, uh, former President Trump. Now, coming up, we look at how today's CPI numbers could impact tomorrow's Fed decision. Is it all going to be about that super cool print? Uh, we will get to analysis of that, of course, and we'll dig deeper into that data and the broader market themes with Peter Chatwell, head of global macro strategies trading at Mizuho International. Plus, a Bloomberg exclusive, the CEO of Barclays, shares his economic outlook and views on the banking landscape. Credit Suisse and UBS's merger has two important consequences. One, for the financial system as a whole, it has stabilized it because a slightly wobbly GCFE bank is no longer there. It's absorbed into UBS in a very solid transaction. The second is, as UBS develops its business model, it will be for Barclays both an important client for our markets business and a competitor for us in investment banking. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, the conversation for the past two years or so has been all about inflation. It kind of feels like we're perhaps pricing in the end of that conversation as the Federal Reserve potentially pauses tomorrow. At least that's what the market has pricing. What's interesting, though, is the logic behind it. For our radio audience, stick with me. We're looking at a chart here of near-term inflation expectations, one year ahead and then three years ahead. And essentially what you need to know is that the line goes up, up, up in 2021 and then really makes a a two-year low as of today. It really speaks to the idea here that perhaps we are really ending uh, this inflationary regime, except when you talk to some of the folks on the market, they say, well, hold on a second. Are we in for this kind of newfangled era of sustainably high inflation? And in that environment, what do you really do with, say, a data set like today's, the CPI data we're going to get in a few uh, hours? Let's bring a true expert. Bloomberg Markets reporter Justina Lee uh, joins us now. Justina, Talk to us about that dynamic here, the market pricing in perhaps this end of the inflationary area, whereas perhaps some of the commentary saying otherwise. Yeah, and the economists really are expecting to see a slowdown in CPI today, both in terms of the headline number as well as the core number. And that should give kind of support for the case of what people are calling like a hawkish skip, which which means that the Fed maybe will not raise rates this time. But maybe it so kind of sets the stage for another hike um, kind of in at the next meeting. And that's currently what markets are expecting. You know, very low chance of a hike this month, but 
a, a way higher chance of a hike next month. And I think that kind of reflects that contradiction you're talking about here, which is that inflation is headed toward the right direction. It is coming down. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's still pretty far from the 2% target that we usually associate with, like, central banks. Mm, I was speaking to a guest earlier who was saying it is going to be all about that core and how sticky it is, how slow that is to come down, because a lot of success has been had with headline bringing that down. But it's going to be a focus on core, then, that might dictate market response here. Let's uh, talk about China. China then, Justina, and what we've seen there. So we saw a cut in the seven-day repo rate. A lot of people are now expecting that the medium-term lending facility rate gets cut, maybe on Thursday. But now we hear talk about a broad package of stimulus as well. There's a, there's a lot of news flow coming out of China. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of funny. We just talked about the Fed, you know, maybe doing a hawkish skip, but China's going in the entirely different direction. And I think, you know, what the news today is about is that China potentially considering a broad base of measures that supports the real estate sector, that supports domestic demand. And I think it's interesting because earlier we can see some reluctance on the part of policymakers to repeat what they did after the 2008 global financial crisis. But I think there are still a lot of questions in the market about whether this is going to work. But it seems, because it seems like this time around, it's not just a matter of supply side issues. It's also a matter of domestic demand. And that can be harder to tackle. But if it does work, I mean, we are expecting support for emerging market currencies, emerging market stocks, as well as commodities, and even European stocks, given the linkages, you know, with the luxury yeah. sector and with the resources sector. Yeah, we certainly see those resource stocks go higher today. Justina, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Justina Lee with the latest on China and other market themes. And for further market analysis, the CPI print later, the Fed, the Chinese data, oil, as you can see there on your screen, go to the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. OD Asset Management has halted redemptions from its Brook Developed Markets Fund. That's after requests exceeded 10% of the fund's net asset value. OD has been praised, praised for redemption requests since ousting founder Crispin OD over the weekend in the wake of sexual assault allegations. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs has rethought its prime brokerage relationship with OD. We spoke with the CEO of Goldman Sachs International. Yeah, as a firm, and frankly our people, we, we hold ourselves to extremely high standards and, and we expect the same of our client base and, and that's how we work together in partnership. And so you know, when new information you know, comes to light in any situation, we'd obviously review it and review it quickly and, you know, and then you know, take the appropriate action. So what, you, you've severed ties or are you still contemplating what happens next? We, we're in the process of, of moving away from, from that business. Crispin Odie has denied the most recent allegations against him. Binance US is trying to prevent the SEC from freezing billions of dollars of assets on the cryptocurrency exchange. The company urged a federal judge to reject the agency's request, saying the move would cripple its business and hurt customers. The SEC sued Binance last week, arguing that it has blatantly disregarded US securities laws. And for the first time since the start of the COVID pandemic, offices in New York City crossed the 50% occupancy market. That's according to data from security firm Castle Systems. It says occupancy last week was up more than four percentage points from the week before. Anna, it's fascinating here to say uh, that office occupancy has broken that 50% level at a time when a lot of people are saying, look, New York City is back. Uh, it's like they never left. But I got to say, living here for, for almost half a decade, it doesn't really feel like those pre-COVID times have really come back. And, and I wonder if it ever will, not just here in New York City, but around some of the major cities uh, in the world. Mm. Yeah, and I wonder what more recently the wildfires in Canada have done to people's uh, uh, assessments of whether they want to go back into offices or not. Um, interesting, interesting data for sure. We've seen big tech, law firms, Wall Street, a, a number of businesses calling their staff back to the office, haven't we? Tightening up those regimes in terms of how many days people are uh, able to spend working from home and how much they must be returned to office. But on the other hand, these are still tight labour markets on both sides of the Atlantic. You wonder where the power dynamic really lies on that front. Yeah, and commuting is a really big part of that. You know, the Biden administration, for example, is supporting a measure that would actually increase fares of people coming into the city. How does that affect uh, just how much people actually want to make that commute?
Yeah, coming up on the programme then, we'll get back to the macro, talking of uh, fares and uh, rising prices. Ahead of today's CPI print, we will talk about that and the Fed's imminent decision. Peter Chatwell joins us from Mizuho International. What does he uh, make of the market's expectations for how close to the top we are in terms of Fed rate hikes? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The latest U.S. inflation numbers come out today. They may give support to Fed officials looking to put their interest rate hike campaign on hold. More signs that China is growing worried about a slowing economy. Beijing is now considering a broad package of stimulus measures, and the central bank surprisingly cuts a short-term interest rate. And Donald Trump's day in court, thousands of supporters are likely to show up in Miami when the former president faces criminal charges of mishandling classified documents. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot going on in this uh, kind of market narrative. And I have to say the political narrative as well. But I have to say it feels like the inflationary story and the Chinese growth story really taking the cake when it comes to the market trade. Yeah, absolutely. The China story certainly filtering through here into Europe. We see some of those luxury names benefiting from China signaling that it is going to in, uh, come forward with some kind of broad stimulus for the Chinese economy. We've seen some monetary policy change on the seven-day repo rate already. Will we get more of that, that medium-term lending facility in focus come Thursday? Uh, so all of that adds up to positivity for stocks, and we see that echoed here in Europe, up by two-tenths of one percent. Here's another sector that really benefits from that, up by 2.4 percent on basic resource uh, stocks. That benefits London and of course, and we know the linkages between European uh, basic resource stocks and the China trade. This is a focus on UK uh, data right now because, of course, we've had the labour market data out for the UK. And we had expected, uh, Critty, that we would see a little bit of slack coming back into the labour market here in the UK. And that was what the anticipation was ahead of the data today. We didn't get that at all. We saw further tightening of the UK labour market, both in terms of the unemployment rate and then we got on top of that, the wage story, which also gained either bo with bonuses or ex-bonuses. It was the same picture. So it's all a pretty hot uh, set, of, uh, set of numbers, and that adds up to a higher expectation of rates from the Bank of England, a higher terminal rate. The market is pricing that in. We go up by 11 basis points on the two-year yield today, and the pound up by four-tenths of 1%. I should say it is in good company. The euro also stronger on broad dollar weakness then, Chrissy. Yeah, that green on the screen translating into the U.S. session as well, Anna, where you are seeing futures higher by about two-tenths of 1%. 43.97 is what you're seeing on those futures contracts. To me, what's interesting, though, is the China story, because even though we are talking about inflation, and the labor story, similar to the narrative you just outlined in Europe. The China story, to me, I think is really more important, given that there is a history multiple times that Chinese growth has a direct impact into the U.S. in terms of the U.S. growth story. You saw that uh, after the global financial crisis as well, which brings to me to why this Asia story is so important. We'll put some numbers on it as we do uh, on Bloomberg TV. The two-year yield at about 4.56, down just one basis point. Nothing too exciting there, waiting for the CPI inflation, perhaps. But overnight, the Chinese 10-year yield, a move of six basis points. That is an over four standard deviation move, which tells you just how big of a deal this unexpected cut was. And as we talk about kind of lifting risk sentiment, copper is a great gauge of that as kind of this global bellwether. You're seeing copper higher by 1.6%, Anna. And that's certainly one commodity that I want to look at when we're talking about just how quickly recession may be on our doorstep. Yeah, there's a lot to discuss today then, isn't there, Chrissy, from the, the China effects, from the tech rally that we've seen of late, from the CPI data due, the Fed meeting, UK data, what China's doing to support its economy. Let's put all of that to Peter Chatwell, Head of Global Macro Strategies uh, Trading at Mizuho International, who joins us, not daunted by the task. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with US CPI then, and what is at stake here? Uh, a lot of people focused on either core CPI yeah. or a sort of super core, where we haven't seen quite so much progress in bringing those numbers down. Is that going to be something the Fed watches? I think every time the, the, an inflation report comes out, the market is quite obsessed about the trend of core and super core and the fact that they're showing evidence of having peaked and the magnitude by which headline falls. And I think that you know, this is likely to be repeated today. And it usually lulls the market into thinking that the Fed can then translate that into some future dovishness. And I must say that I think that this is uh, an, an error on the market's part, uh, as I don't think the Fed will actually be able to deliver 
on the expected future dovishness mm. that the market is pricing. And so today's data is likely to uh, allow that to be priced in with a, with a bit more confidence. Yeah. And I see that confidence as, as not really having solid foundations because it's all about base effects yes. and it's about broad commodity prices, whether it's food prices or, or energy, having come back down to, to, to very low levels. If the economy doesn't go into a recession, those commodities are going to go up. And then we're going to be back into uh, an inflationary environment when services mm. and labour markets are still very tight. So it's, we're not at the point where we can, we can assume that the Fed and other central banks can ease off the okay. monetary tightening. So how wrong is rates pricing then for next year? Then? Yeah, yeah. You don't think we're going to get these cuts? Next year is the most egregious <laughs> of, the, of the rates pricing. And the fact that we can go out to 2025, 2026, and there are no material rate hikes after that, I think is just, well, it's a gift. If you can position for that to be to be different first and foremost, but also I think it means that a number of asset classes are vulnerable to a correction if that is repriced. Now, what it comes down to is what are what is the the interest rate cycle next time around? What is that going to be? Is that as the market thinks that the Fed is going to be cutting down to to two and a half percent and then just putting rates up a little bit? reminiscent of really what, what mm. you know the, the regime that we were in before covid or are we returning back to a, a much higher uh, neutral interest rate environment because we're in a much higher nominal growth yeah. environment well speaking of that kind of perhaps stickier environment that you just laid out how concerned are you about the way that a lot of these central banks are navigating it specifically that that they're navigating it in different ways the idea that the pboc is far more stimulative the boj uh, on pause for what seems like forever whereas the federal reserve is kind of still collaborating uh, or excuse me calibrating uh, month to month shouldn't all of these major central banks be on the same page theoretically I understand your point about the, the theory, but um, the reason that the BOJ and the PBOC are able to take the paths that they're taking is really because the Fed's monetary policy, if you look away from the nominal interest rate, is still easy. If you look at broad financial conditions in the US and if you take into account how well the economy is still performing, um, U.S. monetary policy, I would argue, because the balance sheet from the Fed and the balance sheet from the other central banks is still so enormous, uh, means that the, the economy is still being stimulated, stimulated by all of the, the excess liquidity that's in the system. And I think the common error among central bankers is that they're not taking that into account. And that is what is leading the Fed without deliberately... Um, but, but it's leading the Fed into more of a Bernsian path rather than the Volcker path, which they appear to be wanting to deliver. Peter, talk to us then about this terminal rate that we might be looking at from the Federal Reserve specifically. About a year ago, uh, Bloomberg Economics' Anna Wong made a call of a 5% terminal rate. And at the time, it was extremely, extremely contrary and very out there. Now, uh, we think of it as, as, as nothing. She's now making the call that in a couple of years, with this idea of persistent inflation, we might, might, big emphasis on might, revisit something like 10% as a terminal rate because the Federal Reserve will have to keep rates higher for longer for the exact stimulative reasons that you just mentioned. Talk to us about the repricing when it comes to the terminal rate. How much volatility do you foresee in the next year or two? Yeah, so that's a, that's a super interesting point. Um, and I think that I'd be, I'd be broadly on the, uh, well, uh, similar direction as Anna is. That, I think, it, it's the interest rate cuts for next year and maintaining them over the, the coming uh, two to three years uh, and, you know, not really having any further major interest rates priced into the, into the path that is causing uh, risk assets, um, you know, both equity and credit, to be really priced to perfection at this point. So although investors may feel that they're uh, avoiding duration risks by investing in those products rather than uh, investing in government bonds, I think indirectly they are very, very exposed to a correction of the pricing of the belly, as we call it, of the interest rate curve, say the five-year point on the interest rate curve. So I think unless or until central bankers realise that they have to do a lot more to take uh, liquidity out of the system, so more on QT, 
if they don't do that, then they're going to have to put interest rates up over the next interest rate cycle in a way that is, mm. is really no, nowhere close to being priced in. OK, so, yeah, so we could go substantially higher then in terms of interest rates on that view. Uh, let me come to the UK story because, of course, we've got the tight labour market data. Quite a surprise that data this morning sent the pound higher, sent two-year gilt yields up to levels we haven't seen since the 2008 yes. financial crisis. Uh, we're all looking at the Bank of England then. What's it going to do? It has a new member joining early July, yeah. uh, Megan Green, giving a statement today saying that the MPC must proactively act on inflation dynamics, maybe a little early to say what her full views are just some more lines coming through some second round effects are creeping in to inflation so far so hawkish perhaps yeah it sounds it um, look the UK has a chronic twin deficit problem and I think that that has not been registered at all in the Bank of England's forecasting toolkit they've made a number of really quite uh, extraordinary assumptions about a productivity boom in the UK economy and they seem to not really have the current account deficit um, factored into their model. They have admitted that their inflation model is something that they're not really following now. And I would think that they really need to have a look at monetary trends, monetary aggregates, and to incorporate those into their forecasting model and also more of a global view. If they do that, then I think that they'll see that the UK is probably going to need to run a persistently higher interest rate <coughs> excuse me, to compensate for the, the, the twin deficits that the, the, the economy and the next government are likely to be continuing to run. OK, Peter, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Peter Chatwell of Mizuho International. Uh, coming up, we will get you more analysis on a busy week ahead for markets. We, of course, have yet to hear from the Fed. We've yet to hear from the ECB, the BOJ. And we've heard from the PBOC, but might we hear from them again? More on that coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Preeti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. It's a busy week with US CPI coming out today in just a few hours and the federal rate, Federal Reserve, excuse me, rate decision coming out tomorrow. Joining us now, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee and Bloomberg Markets Reporter Valerie Titel. Mike, I want to start with you here. Simply the idea of the commentary that you are seeing in kind of these economist notes and strategist notes, which is that inflation is going to be higher for longer, that this is a persistent story, uh, one of the Fed's favorite buzzwords, yet the market is pricing in some sort of return to normalcy. What could the Federal Reserve have to say about that tomorrow, taking today's data aside? Well, they're going to take a cautious view, and I think the consensus is narrowly on the side that they will skip a meeting and see what's happening with the economy because they have raised by 525 basis points over the last year and all of that hasn't hit the economy yet. We are seeing inflation come down but as they frequently remind us if you go from 9% to 4% that's great but 4% is still double what yeah. the Fed's uh, target is and at this point they're looking at that 4% to 2% that they want to get to as much more difficult because that's the embedded inflation that we've seen the energy prices go away and service prices went up and they're starting to come down but there's embedded inflation in there and they're trying to figure out how much of that is wages and how much of that is uh, just price taking and so uh, they're going to stay stay firm on inflation and they're going to say mm. we are not giving up until we get to two percent. OK, so they're sticking with their inflation focus, as we might expect. Valerie, uh, given that, what, does, what matters about the CPI data? Does it matter, I could ask? Or maybe does it matter as much as it has mattered in the most recent months, given what we know about the Fed's intention or wanting to, to, to skip this time mm. around? No, look, it's a good question, Anna. The market is really quite split on the answer. You have many prominent uh, Fed watchers who say, you know, that the Fed has really over, over forecast this pause uh, in June just tomorrow, that they're not going to change their mind just on one hot data print because, frankly, they haven't changed their mind on the month of hot data that we have had since they last met. And then the other side of the camp it really wants to take this extreme data dependence, the words that Powell says uh, quite literally, thinking that we could just be one more hot print away from really putting that Fed pause in doubt. And I'm not saying that a, a beat today w would make us price that in officially, but it could get the market to ha hang out somewhere near 50-50 in June. And that's not something the Fed wants to see the day before its uh, decision. 
Valerie, talk to us about the trade here, the trade at play. We're looking at a two-year yield that's getting closer and closer to 5% every morning that I check it. Is the trade as simple as if you have a hot CPI print, you sell bonds? Is that as simple as it gets? Oh, I think it's going to be way more complicated than that today. Uh, to me, the bull case seems a bit more clear in equities. You have to take into account, again, we've had all this hot data, and you haven't had the Fed pull back on this decision to pause in June. You know, that puts a lot of this data dependence maybe in question, right? If they don't hike tomorrow after a hot print today, the, the market's going to start to believe they're not going to be hiking ever again, and this is the end. And that's pretty positive for equities. We would take out some of the what the front end is pricing uh, and the dollar would soften. OK, so we'll watch for that. Uh, Mike, let's put into the conversation a bit of Fed thinking around surprises or, or not surprises, because last week we got a few surprises from some global central banks, from the RBA and the Bank of Canada. They both surprised the markets. The point has been made a number of times that the Fed just simply does not like to surprise the markets. H how is that factoring into your thinking about what they do from here? Well, I think that's why I would lean towards the idea of a skip, because they don't like to uh, surprise the markets. They've learned over the years that it's better to guide the markets. However, in this case, the Fed is so divided that the guidance is kind of all over the place. And so it isn't completely clear what they're going to do. So I think they come out of it by maybe skipping, but... Uh, giving us an indication that they're likely to raise rates in July if the inflation rate and uh, the economy don't slow down a little bit. And that'll probably bring most of the members along with it, and they'll probably get a maybe a, uni a unanimous decision or maybe with one dissent. But uh, they're going to have to frame this to take in both sides, which is something they haven't done for a long time. And i got to tell you, I've been doing this for uh, 30 years now, and I have not seen a meeting in a very long time mm -hmm. where the outcome wasn't already baked in. I always come to these uh, appearances on television and say, well, it's what they say, not what they do. But in this case, it could be what they do. Well, sticking with that concept of kind of the international banking story, how much does the Federal Reserve need to factor in what the PBOC is doing in terms of stimulus and then just the simply the Chinese growth story uh, as we talk about just how much that feeds through into the U.S.? Is China at the end of the day exporting deflation? At this point, uh, China is a minor player in what's happening in the United States, and it's probably going to remain that. It depends on what kind of growth the Chinese get. It looks like at this point they're trying to stimulate domestic demand. And if they stimulate domestic demand, uh, and they've also moved towards a lot more domestic supply, then the money is going to basically, uh, to oversimplify, stay in China. If they're not buying a lot from overseas, and of course we're cutting them off from a lot of technology, uh, then it isn't really going to matter as much to the U.S. Uh, one thing that's been interesting Interesting is that throughout this period of tension between China and the U.S. and to a lesser extent the Europeans, uh, the export levels to China from the U.S. and Europe have remained the same or gone up. So they're still buying stuff from us. Uh, it, uh, it hasn't fallen off yet, but it isn't going to make a big difference to the Fed going forward. Valerie, Michael, thank you very much. Thanks to Michael McKee. Thanks to Valerie Titel uh, with the analysis of the data and the Fed's decisions still ahead this week. Coming up, we will bring you our exclusive interview with the CEO of Barclays, CS Ben Katakrishnan. We will uh, bring you highlights from that conversation shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. The CEO of Barclays says leadership changes at the firm's investment bank and new growth strategies have contributed to higher than usual attrition in recent months. He spoke in an exclusive conversation with Bloomberg's David Weston. We are losing a few investment bankers, but not that much more than what is normal annual turnover. I mean, this is the period in the first few months of the second quarter when people have been paid their bonuses and there's a little bit of musical chairs, as you know. Mm -hmm. It's a time-honored tradition in this industry. Uh, we made a management change in our investment bank. We spent a lot of time last year thinking about what we expected the banking landscape to be over the next decade. So what you've seen is rising interest rates, changing business models, the importance of sectors that are fairly new to the economy, not just technology, but sustainability, mobility, climate tech. And then there is just the different players and the importance of the players in the banking market. 
The private equity groups have been very large. Private credit funds are becoming bigger. They're slightly disintermediating what banks are doing. And we, as we began with a very American investment bank here in the US based from the Lehman acquisition of Barclays, and we've grown in Europe, we wanted to put more emphasis in Europe as well. So you bring it all together, and you're talking about us thinking about the next generation of leadership of the investment bank. Building on our strengths in debt capital markets, but growing in equities, growing in M&A, growing in Europe. And when you do that kind of organizational change, sometimes it has impacts. Well, you suggested something I was curious about. Is, is there a strategic shift in emphasis in the investment bank a little bit away from the United States and toward Europe? Because as I recall, your two co-heads before were based in the United States. The two co-heads now are going to be based in Europe. One is in Europe and one is here in the US. So the, this, it's not a shift so much as an expansion. It is to try to give more attention to Europe, relatively speaking. The US remains critically important to us. And the U.S. businesses are some things, especially in the debt capital markets, where we are absolutely leading and we want to maintain that position. An exclusive interview there with the CEO of Barclays. Now, let's uh, take a look at some of the things that are ahead for us in the trading diary. A U.S. CPI data coming out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. We've talked about it a lot. That is going to be the focus of today. 4.1% uh, is the uh, number to look for in terms of the year-on-year -year print. Exclude food and energy, 5.2%. Uh, then that's going to be closely uh, followed, of course, by the FMC tomorrow, which is why uh, this matters so much. And they start their meeting today. Also at 10 a.m. today, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen testifies at the House Financial Services Committee while in Miami. Donald Trump is expected in court later today. Chrissy? Yeah, and of course, some of the micro stocks to be watching as well. We'll throw those at you as well. Oracle at the top of the list, Anna, hitting that record high is coming after the AI story, spurring that cloud demand. This is a really big deal for a name like Oracle, which doesn't have the cloud market share that its peers, Alphabet and Microsoft does. This could potentially uh, spearhead them into the game higher by about 4.4%. We want to take a look at some of the big tech names as well, Apple and Microsoft. Apple falling, UBS downgrading them on services growth slowdown, saying that their iPhone sales could hit about 1.2% lower in the back half of the year. Microsoft, on the other hand, gaining about six tenths of 1%. That coming off the FTC saying maybe the Activision deal isn't such a good idea. It's a little bit of an M&A trade in reverse. And lastly, in a Carnival Cruise Lines higher by 4.3%. Some of the big banks saying the industry has momentum. OK, lots to focus on then ahead of the market open. Of course, we'll focus on the CPI print a little bit later. Still watching lines coming through from Megan Green, uh, who is going to soon be appointed at the Bank of England. That's moving uh, markets a little. That is it for Surveillance Early Edition. This is Bloomberg.